Let me just say something nice about the Marvel Universe before we get all up in it. Okay. Of all the communities of superheroes that exist, okay, the Marvel superheroes, more than not, derive from some kind of science or scientific principle, if not the people themselves. You look at Spider-Man. You know, he was in his science class, right. and he gets bitten by a radioactive, radioactive spider. spider right? Dr. Banner is a medical doctor. Mm -hmm. He becomes the Hulk. Iron Man is Iron Man. He's right. a total genius. Unlike Batman, not to pit DC against right. Marvel, but Batman is smart, but he's not the one inventing the stuff that makes no, him powerful. Exactly. He's got a, uh, his company. He's got his whole company. <laughs> right. That, that is that's a, producing a all military this stuff for... contracting company. Right. With engineers in the, in the silo doing right. their work. Iron Man is doing all his own work. So I applaud Marvel. I don't know where the science is in Hawkeye. Okay. He's got no powers. No. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and I love watching Black Widow. Who doesn't love some good martial right. arts? Right. But and we don't have to talk about the science of that because that's well, a, yeah, and they don't have powers. They don't have powers. They're just Super very powers. good shots. Yes, <laughs> both of them. Both of them. They'd be great for like maybe the biathlon. <laughs> <laughs> America the once ski. again brings home Olympic gold <laughs> thanks to Hawkeye and Black Widow. Are you familiar with? Go ahead. The periodic table of fictional elements. Oh, well. It's online. Go get check out. it out. Yes, it's all there. I know so, Finkillium is there. Finkillium. Finkillium. That's an element on the original I Dream of Genie. They needed an ingot of Finkillium. There is the stuff that was in the, the absent minded professor. Flubber. 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 Flubber's on the, the periodic table, and it's full. They got a full periodic table. So, I love it. Oh, oh they also have unobtainium. From um, uh, uh, Avatar. From Avatar. That's Avatar. So all these elements are there. So people have thought about how one might organize them. I can tell you this. One of the remarkable things about this universe and the periodic table of elements in particular is that from element to element, the properties can be so different from one another that it is not completely crazy that you just have an element that has all the properties of vibranium. You know, you can take a cubic inch of gold okay. and hammer it so thin that you could like gild an entire football field with it. So gold is the most malleable element. Right. And that's why you gild things with gold. Right, yeah. Okay, because Every, you don't, don't right. take much of it. Yeah. You, it looks like you have a lot. I mean, you can make it so thin that you can actually brush it onto surfaces and gold leafing. Yes, you get gold leaf. Okay. Right. So you look at the diversity of properties of elements on the periodic table. Not only that, the diversity of molecules you can make with the elements. Wow. Here we have sodium, which is a metal soft enough that you can cut with a knife and it's poisonous and it'll explode if you put it in contact with water. Add chlorine to it, a deadly gas, and you have table salt. <laughs> okay? I have oxygen, which love promotes combustion. Then I have hydrogen, an explosive gas. Put them together, you make water right. that puts out fire. Right. So this diversity of properties that tells you that vibranium is one of the most inventive, realistic things you can think of on there. It's got all these properties that no, nothing else has. Right. That's true with anything else that has properties that nothing else has. I've got a friend and colleague of mine from the American Museum of Natural History, Ray Wynn Grant. Ray, welcome to Star Talk. Hi, thanks for having me. I think this is your first time, right? Very first time, not the last. So this is, you are a large a carniv large carnivore ecologist. That's which, right. which I don't even know what that is. Wow, I, I, I kind of <laughs> dig that though. I don't, you know, I'm not sure what it is either, but I like it, you but, know? But more broadly, you care about the environment and the intersection of life and food chain and this sort of thing. And so we've got some questions. So what would happen to the ecosystem if half of all life was suddenly disappeared? Because the bad guy on the Avengers Endgame, snap, well, in the previous movie, he snaps his fingers and half of all life goes away. And in his warped sense of justice, he's trying to help the other half survive so that there's sufficient resources for them. Now, they didn't make it clear whether they killed all half of all plant life as well. Right, yeah. He just plant life is also alive. Then is he killing half of all worms? I was going to say, if his reasoning is that he wants to 
increased resources, then you wouldn't want to kill half of our plant life because that's a resource. Right, for the for the animals. For the animals. So to put, he's also killing half the animals. I, they didn't make that clear, and I don't know if what they did in the comic book, but let me just ask you, if you take half of any animal species that's in equilibrium with its environment, let's start with an equilibrium case. Mm -hmm. It's an equilibrium. Okay. You take away half of them, what happens? That's a good question. Yeah, just like that. Yeah. Yeah, we're in perfect balance, and then you just cut that balance in half. Right, what happens? What happens? Sure, a lot of things happen, and I just want to be clear, this is just the animal species, right? Not plants. Let's assume Let, that they didn't cut the plants in yeah. half. Let's leave the plants yeah. alone. It makes yeah. a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's actually a, um, you know, a phenomenon that might be potentially very helpful to the planet because that's plants- what so That's what Thanos said. That's what he said. That's what Thanos said. Well, the movie is fairly accurate. And what would happen is that everything would be cut in half. So we'd see a tremendous loss. You know, people would be traumatized. There would be a lot of other kind of large brained animals that would be traumatized, right? Like the whales and the elephants and the gorillas that we've noticed can exhibit emotions similar to people. And also grieve. They grieve death as elephants grieve death. So do gorillas uh, and other apes. But go ahead. Right. Right. We've even seen them shed tears and cry in sad situations. So there would be Trump. But in general, what's going to happen is a whole lot of reproduction. And especially with extra space, which means less competition for resources, we might actually see a huge spike in some populations of animal species. So if you think about if you have a small population of deer or some kind of herbivore and a huge meadow full of plant food for them to graze in, they're going to get bigger and fatter. And in the ecological world, that means more fit. So we'll see a huge spike in population, maybe even beyond what ecologists call a carrying capacity. Carrying capacity is a term that we hear right now a lot when we talk about the human population. This would be the maximum number of people, you would say. That's what you're saying. Maximum number for for the resource load, for the availability of resources, the maximum number to stay in that equilibrium. So what often happens is we'll see a population actually spike and overshoot carrying capacity, and then we'll see another kind of mass death event, and it'll get back into equilibrium. So it would actually technically be kind of an ecologist's dream to see this happen, especially in theory, because it would be able to test out a lot of our theories. So it would overshoot? It would overshoot, yeah. Different species and different populations of organisms would overshoot at different times. So like I'm saying, like a deer population, herbivores would probably get there quicker than like whales or elephants or people even. And, and rabbits would get there first. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can bet on that. So it seems to me that Captain Marvel yes. is supremely powerful on a level that should preclude the need for any other Avenger. Y well, yeah. Why do I need someone who shoots bows and arrows when I have Captain Marvel? Why, why do you? Need why do I need what? vibranium if I have Captain Marvel? Mm -hmm. Why do I need Iron Man who can fly with jets when she can move through the vacuum of space? Why? why without a spacesuit. Without a spacesuit. Yeah. Why do I need a Hulk who smashes things when Captain? Why? Why do I need any other Avenger? other than Captain Marvel. <clears throat> Plus, she glows. Yes. What else do you need? You don't need anything. Now, here, I have issues. That's her because, personality, by the way. <laughs> that glow. That glow, I'm just saying. So, now, if you want her to move through space, you can imagine that she quantum teleports. All right. Okay? I don't know if you knew this, but... If you put water in a glass, mm -hmm. it can't get out because the glass has walls. Right. So the walls are boundaries between the location of the water and the table. Right. Does it make sense that if the walls were not there, the water would then settle down and spill all over the table? Absolutely. That's obvious. No, of course. So what that means is the water has a lower energy state it could occupy, but the walls are preventing it. Okay. Because if you move the walls, the water won't stay there. It no, goes it to goes... on its own. Right. It's called a lower energy state. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, by the way, the table is higher than the ground. If you put a crack in the table, it'll go through the table and hit the ground. Right. It prefers to be even on the ground. Right. Than it does to be on the top of the table. That it did to be in your water glass. Mm. Okay. Quantum mechanically, you can trap a particle with the walls of a glass. It's a it's it's a energy well. Okay. Okay. You can trap it there. Well, sorry. Let's look at. Uh, uh, just the water, or a marble stuck in a little skateboard park. Okay. And the marble can roll up and right. down, Back okay? and forth. Back, Back and forth, there it is. Right. It's not leaving, okay? Mm -hmm. If you want it to leave, push it with fast enough energy so it goes over the top and then it goes down to ground level. Right. But you have to give it energy to get over that barrier right. to then escape, and now it escapes. Okay, watch. It turns out, because particles can also be waves, mm. The particle that's trapped in the well is also a wave that exists not only everywhere in the well, parts of that wave exist outside 
outside the well. Mm. So the particle has a chance, a small chance of existing outside of the well, a very high chance of existing in the well. So most of the times you look at the particle is inside the well. Every now and then it escapes. It's outside. Correct. Right. To watch it escape, it escapes instantly. It breaks through the barrier, and no matter the width of that battery barrier, it goes from one side of the barrier to the other in zero time. Right. So if she has control over the quantum continuum, she can then base, it's called tunneling. She could tunnel through any space barrier and be wherever she wants in the universe instantaneously. So she would be, in effect, entangled with the entire that universe. Not very clever, yes. That would be a way to have her move through space in the way that she does. Wow. She she would be quantum entangled with every with location in the location, universe right. so that she could then materialize herself wherever she needs to be. Wow. Having tunneled there through these barriers. Correct. That's pretty wild. Right. That's But she still can't move a damn glove <laughs> into a minivan. <laughs> I should have tunneled. I should have tunneled. tunneled. What was the whole Mobius strip thing? So, remember Tony? He figures out the quantum key to time travel by asking Jarvis for a Mobius strip. And then he actually calculates something using the Mobius strip. And I don't know. From there, I'm like, okay. Yeah. I don't know if there was any real science okay, in there so, after that. So it's called gobbledygook. <laughs> <laughs> Special kind of movie science. Right. So there is such a thing as a Mobius strip. Okay. And a Mobius strip is a fascinating thing. It's a fascinating thing. If you want to make one, mm -hmm. cut a ribbon. So a long, thin shri strip. Right. A ribbon any, of any length. Doesn't matter. Okay. Okay. Maybe make one a foot long, just mm -hmm. for sake mm -hmm. of And maybe two inches wide. Okay. And then you could tape the ends together to make a loop. All right. Okay. Not the sides together. That would make a long cylinder. Right. So to tape the two, two short ends. ends, that would make a loop. Right. Okay. That's nothing odd about a loop. No. There's an inside of the loop. And the outside. And of the outside. Loop. You can paint the inside if you wanted. Okay. You can paint the outside. Right. Okay. Instead, this time, instead of connecting them that way, give one of those edges a turn. Okay. Okay. 180, 180 degree, degree twist. degree twist. Okay. A twist. Right. Then tape them together. So now what you have is kind of an S-shaped, like almost like figure eight that turns in and out on itself. It is so it goes way in more and it goes out. It is way it more profound than that. Okay. Okay, you ready? Go ahead. That thing has only one side. You could draw a line along the length of it as you pull the ribbon through. And without ever lifting your pencil off the page, without ever crossing the edge of the page, you will land back where you started and you would have put a line on all surfaces of it. Ooh. It is it is a ribbon that has only one side. Ooh, I'm trying to picture this And if in you my cut mind. along that line, mm -hmm. if you cut it in half along the line you just drew, uh -huh. you make a single loop twice as big. You don't cut it into two <laughs> oh, pieces. That's, oh, oh, okay. Wait, wait. So, oh, what, uh, so, so it just becomes, wait a minute. I, it, see, I'm pretty it. visual. Maybe you feel I'm it. pretty visual. You're visual dude. No, so I'm, mm -hmm. I'm seeing Because what's happening is the twist now, as you cut, as it opens up, it just becomes a circle. A bigger circle. Okay, that's what it is. It's a big circle. Okay, so now the point is, so you throw in a Mobius strip, which is cool and has a dimensionality interest to it. Okay. Okay? But then you put a time travel spin on it. Right. All right, so if your path through time is on a Mobius strip, you can come back to where you were, but you're not exactly where you were. You're on the, the other, other side, side of that space. Right, but even though okay. it only has one side. It only has one ah, side. Ah, see, that's it. Ah, look at that. Oh, I see what they did okay. there. Okay. All right. So, so if you had to create mumbo jumbo gobbledygook, <laughs> Mobius strip is the way to go, baby. Mobius strip will get that for you. <laughs> Chuck, we have hardly any time left. I'm doing a lightning round. Let's do it. What is the biggest scientific inaccuracy in the movie, in your estimation? On all the spaceships, they no, made no reference of any gravity generator, and they all should have been weightless on their spaceship. Or had men floating boots. through space. Or, yeah, but they didn't show that right. or given a shout out to it. Right. Nobody Some was weightless. Dism, yeah, nobody was weightless at any time. Never. And and the weight matters because you could be standing upside down in the ship, and, and if it's rotating, all of that works. They didn't give any thought to that, especially in the Guardians of the Galaxy people. Okay. Or what creatures. How is it that the Cap, as in Captain America, can throw his shield and it comes back to him like a boomerang? Because it is a Frisbee. <laughs>
Let's be honest. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. I thought it doesn't just come back to him. It bounces off of things back to him. It doesn't just come back like it's on a yo-yo. No, he throws it, it hits its target, and it comes back to him. Uh, Otherwise, he'd have to run after it every time he threw it. That, that, you know what? I, I don't know. Right. But you're so, right. So, you're right. So, it may be hitting if there's stuff a and... thing facing you, right. there will always be an angle with which you can throw something where it bounces straight back to you. So he's just good at pool. He's good at <laughs> he's good at the at the cue shot. Exactly. The, the cue ball shot. He's banking stuff. Right. I, I don't I never remember seeing. Seeing it just go just, and just come playing back. frisbee with himself, yeah, okay. or, or boomerang with himself. Right, it hits something and comes back. Okay, okay, good. Unless I missed a movie that he was in where he did that. Okay, next. What? Plus, it's very boingy, right? It's very boingy, oh, right. right? So it'll it, it'll go and then retain the energy, yes. the coil energy, and come back. Come back. Okay. Ne okay, next. Why didn't Ant Man go up Thanos's butt like you said? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, like I said? What do you mean, like I said? <laughs> okay, that was uh, pretty funny. He'll have to wait for the director's cut. Tony Stark says something like the Planck scale messes with the Deutsch proposition and creates the EPR paradox. So what the. Okay, what is he talking uh, for, about? Forgive me, I don't know what the Deutsch proposition is, but he did mention the EPR paradox, which is the Einstein Podolsky Rosen paradox. That's a real thing. Okay. And Einstein is Einstein, the other two are other physicists, and they got together and explored in the discovery in the dawn of quantum mechanics. It's like this is some weird stuff. Is it real? Right. Can we create a thought experiment that is a paradox that will reveal either a new truth or unravel the truth that we think we've just discovered? So I don't know if there's a Deutsch proposal. Mm -hmm. I think they just threw that in there. If there is, I don't know it, okay? But EPR is a very well-known paradox. So the EPR paradox is real. Well, no, so Einstein, Podolsky, Rosen, Paradox, they, <clears throat> this back in the early days of quantum physics where mm -hmm. we're really scratching our heads. Not we, I, mean, I wasn't there, but <laughs> <laughs> my people, my, right. my physics, right. you know, progenitors here, scratching their heads. What does it mean to not be able to fully know the reality of an object, of a particle? Uh, Heisenberg noted you can't simultaneously know the momentum of a particle or its position precisely at the same time. So Einstein's uncertainty principle means you can't know with accuracy the position of a particle and its momentum, mm -hmm. which means its velocity and which which direction. speed and direction, direction it's going. Speed. Okay, you can't know both simultaneously. The more you know of one, the less you know of the other. Ah. So if you know the velocity of something, you you don't know where it is. Right. If you know where it is, then you know exactly how fast it's going. Okay. Even though you don't know where it is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so this would be good next to, Chuck. Next time you stop for a speeding ticket. Right. And the cop says, "Do you realize you've been going 65 miles an hour? Yeah, but I don't know where I am." <laughs> 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 and if the cop is quantum physics literate, I bet they let you go. Yeah, that's going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so they had thought experiments to explore the nature of that reality. Okay. And it was confronting all of the thinkers of the day to sharpen their ideas about what quantum physics is and what it could mean. So right. at least they made an attempt to made put attempt. some real science Yeah, it was an attempt. It was movie. an attempt. Okay. No. Another one. Quick. Give me a third one. That's it. We got through all the questions. We got through. Oh my gosh. Oh wait, there's one more. One more, go. It says, Neil, I am Groot. <laughs> That's the question. <laughs> that is a question. That's the question. Okay, so I think most people in life never really know who they are. So that really at the end of the day, we should be deeply respectful of Groot, who does. Right, because he knows I am Groot. That is a cosmic perspective. <laughs>